Our opening hymn is 246, hymn 246. <laughs> The order of service is found on page five in the four parts of the hymnal. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgiveth us all our sins. To them that believe on his name he giveth power to become the sons of God, and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Our psalm for today is a portion of Psalm 33, beginning with the 12th verse. And it's found on page 870 in your pew Bibles. Psalm 33, beginning with the 12th verse. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Glory be to the Father.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who has taught us to know and confess in true faith that in three persons of equal power and glory, you are one true and everlasting God, and to be worshipped as such, we beseech you, keep us at all times steadfast in this faith against whatsoever may assail us. O you who lives and reigns, ever one true God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson is found in the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 30th verse. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. So far, our Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgment! and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Here ends the epistle lesson. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Hallelujah. Gospels recorded in the third chapter of St. John, beginning with the first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Here ends the gospel. Today is Trinity Sunday. I ask you now to turn to page 53 in the fourth part of the hymnal that we may use the Athanasian Creed. It uses the word Catholic in its original sense, meaning Christian or universal. And so keep that in mind as we read together the Athanasian Creed. Whosoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, Without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither compounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one the glory equal, the majesty called eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, and the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As there are not three uncreated, nor three incomprehensibles, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. And yet they are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. And yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say, there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons. One Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after other. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. So that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. It is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the world, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who, although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, by taking the manhood into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. 
For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies, and shall give an account of their own works. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except the man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Our next hymn is 380, hymn 380. from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text before us is from the book of Acts, the 28th chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, 
I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some of them were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he had preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. This is our text. You may be seated. Dear fellow redeemed, today is Trinity Sunday. We're at midpoint in the church year. And during that first half of the church year, we emphasize the work that God has done on our behalf. Three great events appear on the church calendar in the first half, and they are Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. On Christmas, we celebrate the gift that God the Father gave, namely His Son. On Easter, we celebrate the truth that Jesus won a victory for us with his death and resurrection. And on Pentecost, we celebrate the Holy Ghost who, with the power of the gospel, has brought you and me to faith in Christ and is still at work keeping us in the Christian faith. Today, we remember there is only one God who has also revealed himself to us in three distinct persons. And while Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each do special things, all three are always working together for our salvation. And let us freely admit that human reason cannot begin to understand the mystery of the Holy Trinity. We just use the Athanasian Creed, and, and the wording in that is written very, very carefully. God never asked us to figure out the Trinity. And that might seem like a small statement, but we don't need to waste your time trying to figure it out. God has revealed himself as triune and then sent us into the world to preach the gospel that flows from our triune God. Our text is from the book of Acts. It tells us some of the history of the spread of the gospel beginning with Pentecost and moving on. It's really the history of the beginning of the Christian church in this world. And at a certain point, we meet a man by the name of Paul, who originally was named Saul. Saul was someone who thought that Jesus ought to be eliminated from our vocabulary and persecuted the Christian church. And that continued until one day the Lord stopped Saul on his way to Damascus. And it was the gospel that turned around Saul's life, and he, now better known as Paul, instead of persecuting, began to preach and spread the gospel. 
Paul was personally trained by Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit led Paul on three missionary journeys. And on that third journey, Paul was collecting an offering for the needy Christians in Jerusalem. And eventually, Paul got to Jerusalem with that offering and gave it to the Christians. And when the Jewish leaders found out that Paul was in town, you could, might call it a mild fight broke out. Paul was protected by the Roman law and in the months and years that followed Paul was not only accused with false accusation, there were trials, there was delay on court proceedings, but in the end Paul, Paul was not found to be a criminal. But because he had appealed to Caesar, he now had to be delivered to Rome. And so the law brought Paul to Rome. Acts records the difficult and perilous journey on the way to Rome. And here we are now in the book of Acts and it picks up the story as Paul arrived in Rome. Now he was in the judicial system. That meant he was still a prisoner. He wasn't allowed to free in Rome as he pleased. At the same time, he was given privileges, so he wasn't in the ordinary prison, but was able to rent a house and stay there under guard, guard all the time. I suspect that one end of the chain was attached to Paul and the other attached to a guard. Paul couldn't leave the house, but that didn't mean people couldn't come to Paul, and so they did. It took only three days, and Paul had a gathering of some Jewish leaders at his house. And he told them, it's because of the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And let us note that even under trying circumstances, Paul continued to preach the gospel as a prisoner. He pointed people to the hope of Israel. And think about expression, that expression, hope of Israel. It's a meaningful expression. And he points out to these Jewish leaders that salvation has been sent to the Gentiles as well. I find it interesting, if not even a bit amazing, that Paul is a prisoner and yet continues to preach the gospel. It's interesting to see how Paul used his status as a prisoner in order to protect Paul from the hostile Jews which then in turn allowed Paul to continue to preach the gospel. He's got the Jewish leaders in front of him. He, he feels compelled to explain to them his circumstances. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving of death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Rome is a long way from Jerusalem. And even though there were Jews that followed Paul, it seems almost every place that he went, they hadn't made it to Rome yet. And so the Jewish leaders in Rome had not heard any bad report about Paul, but then they added, we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. The spread of the gospel was attracting attention. And note the Jewish leaders refer to these Christians as a sect. Now a sect means that it's a small group and often recognized as being far different from the mainstream, in this case, different from the mainstream religion at the time, which was the heathen religions. Jupiter, Zeus come to mind, for example, or a couple of gods that were in, this, in the heathen religion. The Jewish leaders had heard enough regarding 
this sect that they wanted to learn more and so they arranged a meeting. And when that day came, there was even more people present on the second visit than on the first visit. And I'm sure you can figure out the topic of discussion, even if the author of Acts, namely St. Luke, had not told us. Luke simply has Paul saying, it is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So what is better, who is the hope of Israel? Keep in mind where we are in point of time. I'm guessing it's roughly 30 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul is speaking to Jews, so the scriptures they had would be what we today call our Old Testament, what they referred to as Moses and the prophets. They'd heard a few things about Jesus, these Jewish leaders. They should have known what Moses and the prophets said, but they had not yet connected the dots between what the prophets had promised and what Jesus had fulfilled. They didn't connect scriptures with the hope, Jesus, the hope of Israel. I, at this point in my ministry, if I didn't have another meeting, it wouldn't bother me. We got district pastor teacher conference coming up. It's three days long. There'll be a lot of sitting. And it's a study conference, so there'll be a lot of listening. Well, this meeting was an all-day meeting from morning until evening. I don't even know what they did for lunch. But during that whole time, what did Paul do? He pointed to Moses and the prophets. He pointed to the hope of Israel, to Jesus. And Paul told them that Jesus of Nazareth was the fulfillment of that long-promised hope of Israel. Today we use the Athanasian Creed. We also are accustomed to using the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. These three creeds are known as the ecumenical creeds and all of them point to Jesus as the God-man who suffered, died, and rose from the dead. All three creeds point us to Jesus as the only source of the forgiveness of sins. They're called ecumenical, ecumenical because they're used by Christians all over the world. And even though they're very old, throughout the centuries since they've been written, Christians have used them. Creeds, such as the three ecumenical creeds, faithfully teach and confess that Jesus is our Savior from sin. That's why they are so useful. It's like a mini Bible. It's a summary of things taught in the Scripture. And because the three creeds faithfully confess Jesus, they are also a cause of division. Some people do not believe that God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those who deny the Trinity will soon separate from those who believe and confess the Trinity. And there are people who do not believe that Jesus is both God and man in one person. And those who deny what Scripture says concerning Jesus will soon separate from those who believe and confess that Jesus is true God and true man. And so also that day in Rome, when Paul spoke to the Jewish leaders. Can't see it. Some were convinced by what he said. Others would not believe. And because there was some disagreement, that didn't mean Paul was led to compromise and back off what he said. 
They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Some pretty strong words. Paul is pointing to the Lord's message in Isaiah. And God had called Isaiah to preach the gospel to the people of Judah, many of whom were unfaithful. And that one and same message not only brings people to faith, but also for others closes the door to faith for them. And here you and I will be very careful. Our Old Testament lesson clearly said that the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. What's he supposed to do when people don't accept what he says? The Lord desires that all cling to Jesus and be saved. At the same time, some people refuse the Lord's gracious gifts. And when such people hear God's grace, they reject it even more. And so the gospel harden some people in their unbelief. Because the gospel has that effect on some people, you and I should not blame God. Those who die in unbelief have only themselves to blame. Our epistle lesson reminds us also to be careful. God's ways or judgments are unsearchable for you and me. You and I are not God's counselors or advisors. Paul always, when he went to a new location, began preaching the gospel to the Jews first. Some Jews believed Paul's message, and some refused to believe. And so the same thing happened in, in Rome, as Paul preached the gospel. And so Paul wraps up by saying, Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. God wants all people to be saved. It's not our job to figure out who is not going to listen. When people who should know better refuse to believe the gospel, then God takes the message to other people. Paul was in chains. And as you read the book of Acts, as you read his, his epistles, you know that Paul suffered many things during his ministry, endured much hardship. And yet, because Paul knew the message that he had, he continued to spread the gospel and God blessed him. Paul's work. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, because of where he was located, could not be disturbed by the Jews who wanted to silence him. And so even these difficult circumstances were used by God to further the gospel. This is where Acts ends. What happened to Paul? It almost seems like something missing. I'd like to know more information. Tradition tells us that Paul was eventually beheaded after his second arrest. But God didn't tell us everything we might want to know. I would like to know, for example, how much longer 
Paul continued to preach Christ. But more important, Paul is long gone, but the message he proclaimed is still going out into the world, is still being preached all over the world, not just Rome. Paul pointed people to the hope of Israel with the 13 letters that he wrote, so he continues to speak to us. The Holy Spirit led Paul to put those letters into writing so he could continue to speak to us regarding the hope of Israel. And Jesus is our hope as well. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all our understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. offering him him 438 verses 4 and 5. praise of your name, your heavenly Father, for you are our creator and preserver. Especially do we remember your great love in sending your own Son and offering him up for our eternal redemption. Our hearts sing the praise of your name, dear Savior Jesus Christ, for the love with which you loved us in suffering and dying for our sins on the cross. In you, the Son of God and Son of Man, we find hope, joy, and peace, yes, eternal salvation. Our hearts sing the praise of your name, dear Holy Spirit, for you have revealed God's truth to mankind and through it have called us to faith and forgiveness. And without your continual sanctifying work in us through the gospel, we could neither grow in our faith nor walk pleasing to God by keeping his commandments. O triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever for your marvelous works and for the undeserved love and mercy which you continually show toward us. Oh, hear us when we pray. Forgive our countless sins for the sake of him who has redeemed us. Forgive us for failing to worship and serve you as we ought. Let your hand of blessing be open to all of us when we call upon you in truth. 
Nourish us, lest we become faint. Strengthen us, lest we become weak. Cheer us, lest we become depressed with the troubles of life. Hold us up, lest we stumble beneath the burdens that afflict us. Direct our physical and spiritual footsteps, lest we falter and choose the wrong way. Bring us sweet relief from pain and illness. Where encouragement is needed by us, there apply the fitting word. When we need patience in bearing our crosses, then teach us our Savior's own example of enduring suffering. Refresh our memories of all the good things that you continually do for us and open our lips to praise you for them. Lead us daily to search your word that we might be warned and instructed by its precepts and our souls inspired with this message of divine grace and salvation. Be ever near to guard us from sin and unbelief that the devil, world, and our flesh may not have power over us. Yes, make us victorious Christians who are ever faithful to your word and faithful to our calling and faithful to you. Impart all needful blessings to our bodies and souls and do not on account of our sins withhold your help from us. In Jesus' name we pray and join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with hymn 245.
beseech you, Almighty God, unto your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which comes down from above, that thy word as becomes it may not be bound, but have free course to be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and governs with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Hymn 583, Hymn 583. age. 